Thanks, Helen. Well, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet tonight, the Awabakal and Waramai peoples. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners from the lands of those who were watching online. Given my lifetime passion for sport and uh, the privileged position I hold as the leader of Newcastle University Sport, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of the University of Newcastle as we explore the remarkable achievements, resilience and determination of women in sport. At New Sport, we're proud of our role in supporting students, staff, alumni and the wider community with access to sport through our premier facilities, services and diverse programs. Over more recent years, in conjunction with the university, New Sport has supported a range of student athlete initiatives in support of growing participation and opportunities for women in sport, from grassroots sport to elite athlete programs, from local club competitions to individual athletes and teams competing in national and international events. Over the years, women's participation in sport has reached great heights with talented athletes continuing to rewrite history and inspire the future generations. Tonight, we are fortunate enough to hear from a number of athletes with the unwavering dedication to achieve success and reach the heights in their respective sports. I'm sure we'll hear of their challenges, the sacrifices they've had to make along the way, and learn of the key drivers for success as they share their stories with us tonight. So to guide us through tonight's program, I'll now hand back to our MC, journalist and Northern New South Wales football chair, and all-round advocate and champion for women in sports, Helen O'Neill. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. And thanks for the opportunity. And it's great to see some familiar faces in the, in the crowd. And I know Elise is quite excited because a number of the people here tonight have experienced the, the Dads and Daughters program. I was just sharing with Elise out there that I had a one-time job as sport and rec officer at Newcastle Uni. And uh, we, had, we ran lunchtime touch footy competitions. And Phil Morgan often won the best and fairest player. So I go back a long way with Phil. I think he had a bit more hair then and was probably a lot younger, but um, it's great to see people, particularly in Newcastle, people go on with so much and become internationally known. So we're here tonight to not only welcome our fantastic panel, but also to um, welcome Dr Elise Barnes, so the Senior Project Manager and co-investigator on the Dads and Daughters Active and Empowered Program which is a multi-award winning community-based program that engages fathers and father figures in positive lifestyle role modelling and effective parent parenting strategies to improve the physical activity, behaviour, physical confidence, sports skills and social emotional well-being of their daughters. Dr Elise graduated from Newcastle University with a Bachelor of Teaching, Bachelor of PDHPE in Honours and a Doctor of Philosophy. In 2015, Elise completed her PhD that focused on improving the physical activity levels of mothers and their daughters through after-school community intervention. Her thesis was titled The Maid, that's Mothers and Daughters Exercising for Life Project. It was a pilot randomised control trial with a the theory was based on physical activity intervention targeting mothers and their daughters. Dr Elise also brings personal experience to the table, having played representative touch football and has three daughters who are now starting their own sporting journey and I believe one of them sitting right there in the front row, so welcome along. Uh, so she's well equipped to provide some personal and practical takeaways for all of us. So please join me in welcoming Dr Elise Barnes to the stage. Thank you, Helen, and thank you everyone for coming along. 
I think there's a few daughters and dads potentially who have done our program in the crowd. Just give me a little wave if you're out there. Yes, awesome. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, I'd like to also acknowledge um, and respect the Awabakal people, um, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are here um, at the University of Newcastle. And thanks to the University of Newcastle for inviting me to speak today. I'm really excited and I'm very enthusiastic about getting girls uh, physically active and to share this awesome program, Daughters and Dads Active and Empowered. So just to set the scene, first of all, we know how important physical activity is for children and adults. There's many physical, mental, social, and um, yeah, all of these benefits are well established. However, it's pretty alarming that the statistic is 20% of youth internationally don't meet physical activity recommendations. So unfortunately, we live in an activity sapping environment. There are many things that contribute to people not being as active, However, if you look at this steepness of the hill, this is for children over, overall. But moving over here, there are actually additional barriers to physical activity that girls face. This gender disparity exists and it's not getting any better. We know that girls at every age and stage are less active than boys and they have got barriers towards their development on their physical confidence and competence with sports skills. So we need to figure out ways to try and get them more active and engaged and what we can do to empower them in this particular part of life. So a little snapshot, a few statistics here on the screen. So 88% of girls don't meet physical activity guidelines. 74% engage in excess screen time. So that is when they're looking at iPads, looking at screens on TVs or on social media, less than 20% walk or ride to school for active transport, 40% have inadequate fitness. And this is a bit of a tricky one because it's quite alarming that by age 14, 81% of girls drop out of sport and never return. So we need to figure out how we can get them staying in the game and being active. So looking at lack of physical activity and sport opportunities for girls, we know girls are marginalised um, in many environments, in the home, the community um, and school. And there's some key barriers that are affecting girls. So if we have a look at home, the way that girls are dressed, sometimes they are wearing dresses, skirts and also sandals. So let's say for instance you're at a family barbecue and there's a game of cricket or a family game of soccer girls are dressed in that way, they're actually limited in their ability to perform the, sp the skills and the sports because they're not wearing active clothes that are going to support them doing that. Which leads on to school. Now there's an amazing initiative called the Girls Uniform Agenda, uh, School Uniform Agenda, and they're out there trying to increase awareness around choice. So we're not saying there's, not, there's anything wrong with wearing a dress, but what the research shows is in fact, Girls who do have the option to wear a pair of shorts and a polo, they're actually more active at lunch and at school as opposed to be wearing a dress. Also at school, boys tend to dominate the, the playground, so the space that's allocated for sport at lunchtime um, or recess is sometimes not always available for the girls unless they're very confident and go out there and play their sports. So we wanna try and make sure that there's equal access. And finally, in the community, um, dance movement patterns have been associated with working in straight lines and straight limbs versus when you need to use your body for fundamental movement skills like kicking, catching, throwing, striking, you need softer limbs. Um, and finally, in the media, we know that 93% of all media is focused on men's sport. So we've still got a long way to come with coverage. And looking at those sports skills that I just mentioned previously, it's alarming that less than 1% of girls are at mastery for the skill of the kick and the overarm throw when they leave primary school. So we just think about that stat. It's pretty scary because during primary school, that's the time when they are exposed to learning in PE and sport, how to perform those skills, which are going to equip them for playing lifelong physical activity. But less than 1%. It's quite scary. So the graph here also indicates that 
at every age, so this is from year two right up to year 10, the girls are in the light blue, the boys are in the blue, they're always at a lower level of achieving the skills. So they're already marginalized. And unfortunately, this will impact their confidence and competence moving forward to elect to play in social sport and be active if they don't have the competence and the ability to perform those skills. So how can we uh, increase girls' physical activity? There's a few ways. We can make some socio-cultural environmental changes for girls, um, which would reduce the steepness of that hill that I referred to earlier. And we can help girls with providing them with the awareness of gender bias that does exist in our world, whether it's with sport um, or in the community and in the workplace. Critical thinking skills that apply in sport, but also in all environments. Physical capabilities and father support. Our girls need to be empowered, but they also need strong male advocates. And I'm going to tell you why that's so important shortly. So the impact of a positive father, and when I refer to father, I also want you to remember that it's a father or a father figure. So that could be somebody who is an uncle or a stepfather. It doesn't have to be necessarily a biological father. It could be an older brother or another uh, positive male relative. Positive father involvement uh, is impacting on a huge array of valued outcomes for girls. And particularly, if, uh, we're talking about children, but it is imp important for sons, but even more so for daughters. And we've got, gone through lots of research. So this is actually all evidence-based, all these benefits here. So mental health, self-esteem, resilience, um, self-control, all of these things are imperative through positive father involvement. And there's something that I'm going to talk to you about too, which is called the activation relationship, which fathers have a big key place to play with their daughters through rough and tumble play. So why is this, this relationship so powerful for a daughter? So strong father-daughter bond is associated with optimal psychological health benefits. And there's emerging research to show that there's something even more significant and special about the father-daughter relationship and that particular combination and how that impacts on girls' physical health domain. Now, this activation relationship is that emotional bond between a father and their daughter. And we are able to showcase how they can practice that activation relationship during a rough and tumble play session, which is part of the Daughters and Dads program. We know that being active with dads um, is lots of fun, and it's just giving them the opportunity to do that. Secondly, dads generally, because men and boys have always been better at sports skills and physical activity, have the skills to be able to practice and demonstrate with their daughters. Dads do encourage risk-taking behaviours, like positive risk-taking behaviours here, and dads do enjoy, and the kids as much, the daughters, the rough and tumble play which is basically fun wrestling with dad. So how fathers interact with their daughters really matters. <clears throat> this unpredictable, playful nature of rough and tumble play um, helps the enhancement of the cognitive, the physical and social outcomes for children. And research has shown that being active together, so co-physical activity, so doing something simultaneously together, um, has impacts beyond just increasing physical activity levels. So dads who are active with their daughters, we know, have more active daughters, have closer relationships, and have daughters with greater self-esteem and social emotional well-being, which is very powerful. But Less than one third of fathers believe that they have a unique and independent influence on their daughter's life and their well-being. Girls receive less sports encouragement and opportunities from compared to boys, and fathers overall spend less time with their daughters in comparison to their sons. And this next um, illustration is a little bit of a joke, but it is quite true in some instances. There's a girl there and she's balancing her soccer balls and doing some pretty cool things. And she's saying, hey, dad, check this out. Not now, honey, I am playing soccer with your brother. So that is just indicating what can generally happen if you have a pigeon pair. So uh, our team, uh, the lead on this paper, Professor Philip Morgan, who's currently overseas, uh, he 
Um, and, a, and a big team of um, us at the university conducted a systematic review, which is the gold standard at looking at all studies that have been done saying, hey, we've done a program that has impacted on family physical activity. We've had parenting programs. What we wanted to know from this review is how many exclusively targeted fathers. And what we found out of all the studies, that less, it was only 1% of programs that actually targeted fathers. And that was one of our programs that we had also run. Um, so there's not a lot of work in this area yet we know so much about how important that father-daughter relationship is. And, you know, obviously mothers are extremely important. I'm a mother and I know how much I enjoy being active with my daughter. However, all the studies have shown that it's usually the mums that participate. So 94% of those participants were mothers in parent-based programs. So dads don't usually sign up because they don't think that they impact or they matter but we know from the research that they do. So one such innovation was coming up with a program designed for dads or father figures and their daughters to come together and improve physical activity, self-esteem, their social emotional well-being, their sports skills, the father-daughter relationship. And we did just that. So we have published numerous papers where in the research world we were able to show significant improvements in both daughters and dads physical activity, the daughters sports skills, so that's like kicking, catching, throwing, underhand throw, underhand throw um, and the strike, the father-daughter relationship, social emotional well-being outcomes for daughters and improved parenting outcomes for dads that then went back into family life which is really powerful and also reduce time in screens. Um, Daughters and Dads has won uh, national and international awards for benefiting society. Um, and just recently, uh, one of the Daughters and Dads cricket papers, which I'll talk to you about the sports specific version soon, uh, just won best uh, international paper um, at a conference overseas in Stockholm. So the Daughters and Dad journey, it's, it's a juggernaut. There's a few different pieces to the puzzle that I'm going to explain to you here. But the original version of the program, um, Daughters and Dads Active and Empowered, started in Newcastle in 2014. And it's since been delivered across New South Wales um, through sport and rec centres and also in partnership with Gymnastics New South Wales. It's um, ran through their centres. And the program has also been delivered in the UK through Women in Sport UK. Um, in partnership with professional football clubs, as well as in Austria and South Africa. So it is global. And this next slide is going to give you a little snippet into what it looks like, and maybe some people in the audience could be featured in this video, so let's see. in that video that's here tonight out of interest <laughs> it's a bit hard to see in the dark there so that's a little snippet into what the classic or the original program looked like that was filmed at the University of Newcastle many years ago 
So why are Daughters and Dads active and empowered? Here are the reasons why we've developed this program that is the international first of its kind. We know that girls are marginalised in sport and physical activity and by age 14, 81% drop out and don't return to sport. So we need to create something where we keep them involved in the sport. We're engaging them in the sport with their dads with a safe, supportive environment. So there's no real competition. You're there with your dad or your father figure. It doesn't really matter about anybody else on the outside. You're just having fun in your own little silo, but learning and engaging in so many important benefits around physical activity, sports skills, as well as social emotional outcomes. So more uh, variety of activities is going to lead to a greater benefit for those girls in their sports skills. And there's no lines. So if you can imagine what maybe sport looks like for training, you might have the coach and you know, 15 or more children there and there's one ball or there's one set of goals and there's one long line. None of that exists. So the engagement in the activity is very high and it's constant. So they're always learning and being active and involved. We know dads can accelerate their sports skills development because they're a one-on-one -on -one coach. And there's fun physical play elements to the program. We know that through research that dads provide positive parenting strategies to their daughters and they can take this back to their family and impact their overall family, whether they've got other siblings, the, the, they've got sons um, and their wider community. And number six, enhancing girls' well-being through developing their social emotional skills and those sports skills, spending quality one-on-one -on -one time. So it's in the diary, it's a weekly activity that they do together and they're coming together with a group of like-minded people. It includes a home program, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, they take home and can actually do parts of the program as a family and practice and enhance their skills. And finally, it also empowers girls to be gender advocates. And it is ad addressing the gender inequity that we are still seeing to this day. So if you have a look at this bottom image here of there's three people and they're looking at a baseball game. So the first image there shows what equality is. Equality means that everybody gets the same and it should be fair. However, if we go over to the second image, equity represent where you're giving somebody an additional support or resource to help them achieve a fair and equal outcome. So really, the tall person didn't need a box. The person in the middle, yep, definitely helped them see the game, but the person on the end, they needed a double box. And that double box there shows exactly what Daughters and Dads is doing. It's essentially a double box to giving girls and fathers uh, gender, ad gender advocacy um, lenses through their uh, gender glasses, improving their physical activity and enhancing their sports skills, which is what we know they need. So the program structure is referring to what happens. Like, what do they actually do when they come along? There's a one dads only session where the dads get all of the information given to them around parenting, around physical activity, and why they matter in their daughter's lives, and why it is so key that they're there doing this to enhance their, self, their daughter's confidence and their gender awareness around how can I be an advocate to speak up if something's not fair or equal for me. The Daughters and Dads session then follow eight weeks um, consecutively after that and it starts with an empowerment session which is like a 30 minute classroom simulated um, PowerPoint and they get content each week. They learn about important words that are going to help, help and enhance their social emotional wellbeing and then they go outside for the fun, the practical element of the program for the active session for one hour and that's the activity handbook there that's got lots of resources that they can do and use on the weekend after school. So in those active sessions, this is what rough and tumble play looks like. It's play-based wrestling in a safe environment that's actually really good for brain development for children. And the, yes, there's an 80-20 rule with that. So that means that daughters win 80% and dads only win 20%. So we've got to try and explain that to the dads in that dads only session so they don't try and be really competitive with their daughters. <laughs> Uh, sports skills, so this is around kicking, catching, throwing, striking uh, and bouncing. So each week there's different skills that they're practicing and they're fun activities. They're not just plain old boring drills, they're interactive, there's game, there's hooks because they were there with their dad. 
And finally, there's a lot of fitness in it, in it as well, but it's working together in a really fun environment to increase dad's and daughter's fitness. The biggest thing here is that they're active together the whole time. So sometimes they might not even realise what's going on around them. They're just in their own zone and you can just sit back. If you're facilitating a program or if you've ever been to one, you just look at the enjoyment on these daughters and dads' faces and it's really powerful and it's very special. <clears throat> now we have uh, seven words of empowerment that we teach the dads and daughters each week. So they get a new theme and it's just as important for the daughters as it is for dads because they're both going out into the world to practice these skills. So staying calm with self-control, Positivity, smile on your face, it's my favourite one. Uh, persistence, to keep on trying. Self-reliance, do it myself. Critical thinking skills, ask questions. Resilience, stay strong. And bravery, have a go. So all of these improve social and emotional well-being and they're fantastic for the dads to apply and the daughters in their lives, not just in sport, but at school and out in the community. We'll talk about some examples of that a little bit later. We also teach about pinkification and that girls are valued on what they can do rather than how they look. So what messages are girls actually seeing? <clears throat> All of these words that you see on the screen here are focused on appearance or associated with being passive. And by constantly saying these words to girls, we're teaching them that girls have a value coming from how they look. And that's not what we want them to know. They've got so much more to give, so we shouldn't be reinforcing this. And there's nothing wrong with saying these words to girls, but if that's all they are hearing and they don't have balance, then they should be also hearing things like, you're courageous, you're brave, you're persistent, because those things matter about how they are able to apply that to school, in the sport context, and just in life. And also we refer to some of these passive messages that, say, Disney princesses offer. Um, say, for example, Belle, um, you know, she's valued on her beauty, or Ariel, um, you know, she gives up her talent to go and be with a man. So it's not really sending the messages that we would want for girls to think, oh, that's what I have to do. We want powerful role models. So rather than having girls rewarded for their looks, rather than who they actually are, we give them some skills to be able to look at things. Maybe it's at the shops or maybe they're looking at gifts that they've been given and it's like, well, why is it that there's a boy's toolkit but then for the girls it's just about a nail kit? Sure, it's definitely about balance but it's also about choice. And unfortunately, the big marketing companies are making lots of money by putting things into specific categories. What we teach in Daughters and Dads is that colours are for everyone, toys are for everyone and jobs are for everybody. It's a big, important message that is shared. So it's about balance. We give the girls skills to use their critical lens, their gender glasses, to go out in the world and question things. So we teach them, you know what, stop and think. If you heard something in the schoolyard or if you heard something, ask yourself, is that fair or unfair? Is it true or untrue? And if it's not, and if it's unfair, you can either smirk on the inside or you can speak up and ask questions. Or we say, go and discuss it later with your dad. Hey, dad, do you know what happened at school today? Oh, my teacher said, um, can I get a strong boy to lift these chairs? But we're strong. We can lift a chair. Just because we're a girl doesn't mean we can't lift it. So it's letting them have that lens of why it's so important to speak up or have a conversation with your gender advocacy um, father or family. So gender glasses are not real glasses. They're imaginary glasses that uh, we give to the families to help them um, see the differences and opportunity for girls compared to boys. So hopefully by the end of this, you may be wearing some gender glasses. Um, so this is just a little example. There's a little um, activity that we get the daughters to do and it's like a diary they get to keep um, and just write down things that they may have seen. So the first example I'm gonna read here is uh, a daughter said, um, tell us what you saw through your gender glasses um, Oliver at school said, girls can't play soccer. What was your response? I said, girls can do anything. How did that make you feel? Really annoyed. Uh, second one, Sophie said, the boys were only choosing boys for soccer team because boys are better at soccer. Um, what was your response? The girls formed a team and they played against the boys and they won. 
and she felt good to prove them wrong. And the final one, which I really like, Imogen has written that everyone was playing soccer at school and a boy said to this other boy, you kick like a girl. And what was your response? Don't compliment him. <laughs> she felt funny on the inside. So it's just giving them that awareness to reflect and think, hang on a minute, that's not right. That's not fair. So let's speak up about it. Now, the second part to this talk is explaining that there's another part of the puzzle for daughters and dads, which is the sports-specific versions. Um, so the New South Wales Office of Sport um, funded to run a weekend version of the program um, across New South Wales at sport and rec centres. So this photo here was from a program near Tamworth and they were doing the mud run. So it's like a really nice um, program which is bundled into a Friday through to a Sunday where they go along and do the program but then also do the camp activities and have a lot of fun bond bonding together and with the other families that go along. Um, and our sport-specific versions of the program have been funded through the Her Sport Her Way um, funding at the Office of Sport. And we have three versions, and it's pretty much in line with um, the World Cups that have come out with these sports in the order. So we have Daughters and Dads Cricket with Cricket Australia, Daughters and Dads Basketball with Basketball New South Wales, and finally Daughters and Dads Football with Football New South Wales and Northern New South Wales Football. So all of these programs offer something slightly different and more um, powerful in regards to that particular sport to increase grassroots participation and get girls active in those specific sports. So the skill proficiency, the sports enjoyment, participation, still we're looking at daughters' social emotional wellbeing and using fathers with their coaching skills and improving that father-daughter relationship. <coughs> Importantly, these sport-specific versions are there to provide a strong pathway to the sport for those daughters and help daughters and dads develop an affinity with the game. Because we have daughters that sign up to these programs that maybe already are playing in community club level, but we also have others who have never played before. And it's a really nice introduction to the sport because you're there with your dad and there's no judgment. You're able to play and develop those skills in that environment before you go out into the big world and sign up and think, oh, I don't have the skills. I don't want to play again. And then you leave and you don't come back because that's not what we want. Words of empowerment. We have specific ones that you can be related to the sport. So being resilient having a go and being brave and persistent, keep trying, which I'm sure we're going to hear from our panel members later on the stage about how they've used their um, words of empowerment in their life. So for football, there are the goals of empowerment. In basketball, it's the uh, rings, uh, hoops of empowerment, and the stumps in cricket of empowerment. So just a quick example of some of the content. We're actually teaching the girls and the dads about the game. Maybe they don't know about the rules in cricket. Maybe they don't even know what some of the names of the pitch layout is. So here's an example. Hey, daughters and dads, in the, um, the session together, empowerment, can you guess what the numbers are? And then they discuss that. So they're learning and they're getting education around what the sport is and how that's applicable if they're going to watch the sport or play the sport. Here's an example from basketball. Um, the daughters and dads watch this video together, so they're encouraged to watch female athletes playing the game, and they need to identify two different types of shots in basketball. And then they're asked to discuss that, um, what they saw in the session. So when we're giving them the opportunity and the encouragement to go and watch female athletes playing these sports, it can develop an affinity for the game. The daughters see it. Oh, there's some girls playing. Oh, because we know that in the media, it's not equal. It's not shown, so you've got to seek it out. Here's an example from Daughters and Dads Football. Big part of the program is that we love female role models because they are key. And a football game changer, we've got here Ellie Carpenter. You learn a little bit about this specific player. She also played at the Jets um, and then plays for um, Matildas. So looking at, hey, like she played grassroots football and now look where she is. Maybe I could be like that. <coughs> so. One of the main quotes that we would refer to in Daughters and Dads is, if she can see it, she can be it. So that's really important because if you don't have real life examples, how are you to know what's possible? So rather than just telling girls and women um, that you, know, you can go and play a range of sports, we need to actually give them some powerful people to look up to and maybe even just go and view at a local game. 
Um, at the moment, we know women's sport is not viewed anywhere as often as men's sport. So we have a long way to go with the media coverage. But most recently, um, Brad Jones over at Broadmeadow Magic, who's one of our daughters and dads facilitators for uh, football, uh, created a, a specific week where the families got to come along and be mascots for the game and do a little half-time play, which was awesome because bringing them all together at the highest grade club of football being played, seeing girls play, but being a part of it, it's really special. And that could change the trajectory of some of those girls' pathways to continue playing football where they may have never signed up to something like that before. So there's not enough interest from women and girls, but a spark can start a great fire. And daughters and dads can be that spark. We want to help them increase and have motivation to play. And this in increased motivation can then also instigate them wanting to do more sports and be open to trying more things. Um, so even this little example here, there's a girl in the backyard, she's wearing a Matilda's jersey. She actually went to a game and was given that by Emily Van Egmond, who is actually a Newcastle local. And ever since she got that, she was in the backyard practicing because she wanted to be like her hero. So it's just something as small as that that can actually change their the insight for a child and a daughter to go out there and say, I want to be like them, and they've got that hunger. So the next slide I'm going to show you is actually a little snippet from our Daughters and Dads football program, and there may also be some in the crowd here today. Playing football makes me feel bubbly, excited. It makes me who I am. I like playing football with my dad because I get to bond with him. It's the first program of its kind internationally that's specifically focused on daughters and dads uh, to improve physical activity. But most importantly, we, we've seen improvements in the father-daughter relationship and also the daughters improve their social emotional well-being. So that, in, that includes persistence, resilience, bravery, confidence, positivity. All of those are fantastic for sport, but also everyday life skills as well. I saw it as a great opportunity for Abby and I to have some special bonding over a common interest, which is obviously football. And it's obviously scheduled that we have to have time together. And I think most of all, we love the rough and tumble, don't we? noticed a lot of changes in Mia since she started the Daughters and Dads program. She's a lot more confident in herself and her soccer skills have come on fantastically. The drills are so well designed, um, there's a no queuing policy so you're always running, um, always doing something the whole 90 minutes of the program and, and you can really see the benefit in Mia's skills. The dads offer that safer, supportive introduction into the sport for daughters. It's like the dads are the one-on-one -on -one coach for the daughters so that's why we see huge improvements in their sport skills. But most importantly, Dads also learn and understand to be gender advocates and daughters become empowered to address and challenge some of the gender biases and stereotypes which exist every day in their lives. So what's the impact overall of the Daughters and Dads Active and Empowered program and all of the sport variants? So we've had over four and a half thousand daughters and dads complete the program. So that's thousands of empowered daughters with improved social, emotional well-being, sports skills and physical activity levels, and thousands of fathers equipped as gender advocates, which is very powerful. And they're taking those messages to their broader families, their communities and their workplaces and making a difference and changing and shaking things up. We've also trained over 300 facilitators to deliver the program and those facilitators are people like coaches or teachers, uh, community members who are interested in delivering the program. Um, and they're equipped with evidence-based pedagogy strategies and gender glasses, which is, again, able to improve opportunities for girls and women. Also, um, our research has shown that the daughter's likelihood of playing the sport post-participation in the program has increased through doing Daughters and Dads. There's been multiple cricket and football teams formed since doing the programs um, off the back of Daughters and Dads. And 
this is obviously a huge uptick for father involvement um, in terms of being coaches or in sporting clubs, um, scoring and refereeing. We're also conducting some long-term follow-up on the original daughters and dads that participated back in 2015 to see where they are today and how has it impacted their lives, their sporting journey and, you know, wearing their gender glasses, what has changed. So that's going to be a really powerful paper that's going to be published because we have a lot of anecdotal support to say how uh, imperative it has been to where they are today that we're able to publish that in the research journals. And due to these holistic benefits around evidence-based pedagogy, social, emotional well-being, critical thinking skills, positive parenting and gender equity, um, we also have a university-based course for teachers who are undergraduate, um, PE, primary, um, as an elective and early childhood to do the Daughters and Dads course. So essentially they're then equipped as gender advocates and have all the information and the knowledge to go out into schools which is very powerful because it's impacting both boys and girls and teachers and staff. So um, the other photo that you've seen here is the um, Secretary General and the Chief of Women's Football from FIFA. This was only a few weeks ago. They went and visited a Daughters and Dads program, a football one that was run in Sydney, and they have been quoted to saying that this was the best that they've ever seen. So fingers crossed there could be something coming with FIFA in the future. That would be awesome. And we've also got a, a grant to be working with West Cycle on a Daughters and Dads cycling specific program, which is really in, important and, and very unique. So I'd just like to thank you all for being here today and hopefully opening up your eyes to wearing gender glasses. And if you're a father or a father figure in the room, you matter in your daughter's life. And girls, let's get active and continue on this sport pathway. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Elise. That was fantastic, very enlightening. and. Uh, Yes, it's good food for thought, isn't it? When I have a look in the audience, there's a lot of women here, so maybe we need to drag a few more men along so they can um, see what we did. Just as a matter of interest, I was fortunate back in 1992 to work on a project with joint funding from Newcastle, University of Newcastle and the Australian Institute of Sport, the Australian Sports Commission, and it was called Hunter Media Link, and I was a project officer, and it was to measure the amount of women's sports coverage in the local area. And we worked with um, local sporting groups and we had it up to 21%. So that, that figure you showed, Elise, was 10%. So we think we've gone forward, but think about it, yes. So the next part of tonight, I'd like, to, I'd like you to invite to the stage Tara Andrews. So Tara is a former Newcastle Jets player and also a civil engineer. So welcome, Tara. Uh, Philippa Anderson, if you follow surfing, you will know that name for sure. Philippa is a professional surfer and also founder of the Philippa Anderson Surf School. Welcome along. We do have an apology from Sam Poolman, who's the former Jets netball and Adelaide Thunderbird commentator. But we do have with us Susanna Cook. Su Susanna is a women's rugby for both the U University of Newcastle Sevens and now the Hunter Wildfires, and is a fourth year University of Newcastle Bachelor of Medical Science and Doctor of Medicine student. So well, well done, Susie. <laughs> and welcome back, Elise. So I'll be doing the drill. I probably should sit in the middle because I've got the dress on, you know, and I won't be playing tonight. I've had my day in the sun. So let's all mix and match the questions and then there will be time for audience participation um, in the last couple of minutes. So we'll start very... Briefly, I guess, so we all have plenty of enthusiasm to project to the audience. Susie, tell us about the path. Susanna, tell us about the pathway in, in rugby. I can go with Susie. That, that'll work. Um, yeah, gender glasses, <laughs> yeah. friends, whole deal. I didn't start playing rugby till I was um, second year in college. 
I sort of didn't really know it was an option until that point. Um, and one of the clubs wanted to start a team, so I thought that was probably a good level to start at if everyone else was new as well. Um, that was in Sydney when I was studying sports science, and then um, after a couple of years, finished that and moved up here to play, and the Hunter Wildfires played in the same comp as the club I played in for Sydney, so I thought um, that's a pretty good transition, and I haven't um, put the boots down since. Actually, as I say that, there's a few injuries in between, but... Currently less, injured? The You're currently down. injured, aren't you? Yeah, yep. Kind of did my... Um, tore my hammy on Saturday, sadly, so I'm moving a bit slower than I was last week, but that's... It's all part of being active, I guess. Well, doing medicine, you'll be able to heal yourself down the you'd track think, anyway. Yeah, you'd yeah. think a bit faster, yeah. Philippa, those uh, great waves, there's nothing better than watching Pipeline and people, you know, conquering it, let alone getting smashed by it. How did you get into uh, surfing? Um, I was very fortunate. We were a very active family um, and very beach orientated. Um, did the, the nippers, going down to the beach um, every weekend. My older brother and... S oh, yeah, my older sister surfed as well. Um, and my dad grew up surfing and we just... Yeah, all I can really remember was just being around the beach. Um, and I actually bodyboarded for a long time before that. Um, my older brother kept saying it wasn't cool, you need to get on the surfboard. <laughs> and then, yeah, I guess I, I was very active and I, I just loved the beach and I, I guess I just, yeah, I started to follow my brother around a bit more and, and my dad and I think when I was probably about nine, eight or nine, I, I got on the surfboard. And did that take place in South Africa where you were born originally? Uh, yes, yes. So my family and I were um, immigrated to Australia when I was 12, so... I did spend a lot of my childhood growing up in South Africa. Um, and, yeah, like I said, we were very lucky to be right opposite the beach. And then we ended up in Newcastle, Merriweather, um, close to the beach as well. And, yeah, I haven't – well, I'm still doing it, so, yeah. <laughs> and, Tara, oh, I know you were as equally at home on the netball court as you were on the soccer field. Did the, Was there a time when you had to choose a path and how easy or hard was it for you? Yeah, so I started playing netball when I was about four. I think that was the earliest mum could probably get me into netball. Um, and I didn't start playing football until I was about 10, so just in primary school. I went to South Public, um, lots of soccer players that come out of there. So that's where I started playing and I tried to do both for a long time because I just I loved playing sport and, and doing anything I could. So for a long time I did that and then it sort of got to the point where I did have to choose and... I guess the, the thoughts that went through my mind were what's going to give me the most opportunity to be able to go overseas and, you know, football was the world game and still is the world game. So um, that's why I made my decision sort of to play football but I still I love netball and I love playing both sports and, um, yeah, that's sort of how I got into it and had to made, make my choice at some point but, yeah, still love playing any sport I can. Did money ever come into it, to the decision? No, it wasn't really money. It was just the opportunities to be able to go overseas. Like, I could, I could play in any country in the world, really, whereas netball was, you know, Australia, England, and there wasn't really any competitions there. So it was more about the opportunities to, to go overseas. Yep. And, Elise, what about your, you know, we know about your research career. What about your uh, sporting pedigree? I'm not as elite as these amazing women on stage here, but I definitely was active from a young age and always played a variety of sports. But um, I, I loved team sports and touch football was something that I really enjoyed. It was very social as well. And I had a lot of opportunities during school um, to go and play rep. So that was obviously fun because you're taking away from, well, school's very important, but having all those opportunities to go and play um, instead of being at school was great because then you got a new social network and um, I think that also led me into uni games. I played when I was studying um, my Bachelor of Teaching and, and Health Phys Ed, which is my interest as being a PE teacher too, which I love sports. So, yeah. So on that note, Tara, Elise has mentioned that, you know, she was happy to be a participant and loved it and have fun. How important is it for sporting bodies to project uh, a sense of in inclusive inclusivity and welcome and respect despite the level that you're playing? Yeah, I think the most important, like, for what sporting bodies can do is 
I guess to have us included is we want access to all the same facilities. We want to be able to have the physios and massage therapists, all the fields open, you know. There's a time a few years ago when I was uh, with the Jets, we were travelling to Melbourne um, and the men and the women were playing at the uh, same place. We all rocked up to the hotel and we had separate meal rooms um, and we walked past the men's meal room on the way to ours and they had two massage beds set up with two massage therapists and we, d we didn't have any of that. So every, every time they get to their, um, you know, if they're playing an away game, they all get massages the day that they arrive. We've never had any of that. So I think it's just about having access to the facilities, the, the people that you need access to so you can perf perform at your best at any time. Philippa, what about on the um, surfing circuit? I mean, that's becoming one of the sports where there almost is equal media coverage, you know. People can rattle off household female names as much as many men's names now. Do you uh, f get that feeling? Definitely in the last five years, we've... I think we still have a very long way to go within the surfing world. Um, but a massive improvement just with equal pay that got announced uh, before COVID um, and along with that, that was so positive for the top tier of the surfing. But what a, a big problem was, um, um, I guess, uh, the saying was, oh, when the waves are bad, we'll just throw the girls out. Um, so that was uh, a huge thing and it wasn't, so much the WSL, so the World Surf League, who um, a lot of the high competitions fall under, it was more the actual male surfers themselves just didn't believe that we deserved that. And it has changed so much, um, which has been great because now the males are actually recognising, okay, these girls do surf good and we're slowly, Hopefully, I think in the next couple of years, going to be right on par when it's like, yep, the male, the best male and female surfers of the world, and not just the best males. That female word is going to come in. Um, a lot of hard work from Jesse Maladai and a lot of, um, I guess, girls like myself that have been doing it for so long that just keep pushing. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I guess it's also just, as Tara said, the we just want access to that, and because um, surfing has been. A very male-dominated sport for a long time. Only in the past ten years it has changed. It's still got a really long way to go, um, but it's definitely moving in the right direction. Great! I love seeing women out there at Chow Pool. And the big swells are on, and the yeah. men wimp out. It's great. <laughs> what about Susie? Tara mentioned that when she was in the women's jets and the men's, and you walk past their change room, they probably had the baked dinner. You probably had the pack sandwich. So playing in the wildfires where I noticed this Saturday is a full day on so the women but you're on at 1.30 and the men are on at 6. So there's a couple of games the Colts and I think the second grade in between. So does that sit well and how how do you think the the, the club gives you a fair go? Yeah I think as long as it's moving in a positive direction I'll, I'll take that as a win like last year one of the games had to be played on one of the sort of the back ovals and would it be Colts, which is like the um, under 21s men's or would it be second grade or would it be first grade or would it be women's? And it was like, no questions asked. Obviously the women will go. And it was, it was such a bad field. Like I've played on some really bad fields, but it, it was pretty bad. And we, we suffered, I think like an ACL, a broken leg, a, like countless injuries that just girls still coming back from we haven't seen this year. And one of the girls needed physio help and she had to run back over to the other field to try and find the physio who's at the men's game to try and get her knee looked at so she could then run back and play for our game. So this year moving forward, at least it's a discussion. Um, they're kind of consulting us, like um, getting, I guess, a bit more field time. It could definitely be better, but um, like this year we have women's cut kit, which for club rugby is really hard to find in Australia. It's normally just the men's sort of leftovers. So. Again, we're going to take, take the small wins. Um, and I know there, there's a lot of people this year at Wildfires doing a really good job at kind of identifying those areas that they just... It's not that they intentionally, I guess, put the women off to the side. It's just they just didn't really think about it. So 
it's good to see now that those conversations are happening and um, yeah, generating a bit more momentum forward. But while we're on that topic, it's I've seen it um, playing for Brumbies, which is I guess the highest level of um, rugby union in Australia, unless you're playing for the national team. Um, a couple of years I was playing for them and we women weren't getting paid at that point, so like flights and fuel and everything down there, it's all kind of out of your own pocket. And I remember turning up a couple of hours early because I'd just driven like five hours from uni and I didn't want to be late, so I left a few hours early and they have like a kitchen and a sort of lounge room for the players. So I was like, oh, I'll just go and make a coffee and then they're like, oh, sorry, women's, you're not really allowed to, that's kind of just for the men. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, I'll just go and do some extra gym or something like that. So I go to go in the gym, they're like, no, no, sorry, you guys get your 58 minutes between the men's academy and the men's team and then you can go on the field. So I was like, you just, you're doing it for free and you think something like a coffee that would cost an organisation nothing. They just hadn't really thought through that. So a few years later, it's definitely getting better, but I think, yeah, we're going to keep pushing for more and more. I think you're getting plenty of data here, Elise, for your next project. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the cost. I was thinking that while I was watching the dad's program, that it, and I think now it's fair to say the cost of living is skyrocketing for everyone, and all girls have mentioned the cost. So is, what's the cost of that sport, and is it an introductory into what's to come for when these girls start registering in, at different levels? Okay, so are you asking the cost to do the program, yeah, as in daughters and dads? Mm. Yep, so our, our classic program, which is ran uh, in Newcastle, uh, funded by Port Waratah Coal Services, that is running in term four this year, and that is free. So you can come along to a nine-week program, and it doesn't cost anything. Um, the daughters and dads, basketball, football, and cricket, uh, those ones, you can use active kids vouchers, so they're around um, $120, $100, um, per head. So, I mean, if you look at that compared to how much it costs to enrol in swimming lessons or it is to enrol in, in a whole sport, it's actually quite good because you're getting great value when you've got a dad and a daughter attending and that's for them to come together. Um, but, you know, I think that the big thing is like a common theme is that we don't have enough visual of the, you know, women's games and girls playing. And if we had more money put into it and more sponsorship, then surely... There's, we're going to be gaining higher ranks in terms of equ equity, we're achieving that, so that we've, we've got sponsors who are going, no, you know what, like, we are going to fund that women's Brumbies team. Like, that's just outrageous that you've got to pay for everything to get there. You're studying and then you're told, like, I'm sorry, you can't have a coffee and you can't exercise here before your game. It's just, it's 2023. So we need to call it out. And that's where we are raising these gender advocates of, of young girls and fathers to say, hang on, that's not fair. And what are we going to do about it? And how can we raise the voice around that? So, Tara, only 23 days till the Women's World Cup, the FIFA Women's World Cup here in Australia. Much excitement around locals as well as national and international levels. How, how are you feeling? Have you got your tickets? Very, very excited, as you can imagine. Um, I guess having a World Cup in Australia is, to start with, just crazy to even think that that could have ever happened. Um, and I think, I guess I mean two minds about it. I'm really excited and, you know, I've got my tickets and everything, but I guess one thought goes to, you know, the advertisement of the Women's World Cup. I don't know anyone in the crowd, like, how much have you seen? <laughs> You know, if, if we were having a Men's World Cup in Australia right now, I'd say it would be on every post. So, um, you know, it's probably not getting as much advertisement as it deserves, but I'm obviously still very excited about it. And a lot of women and men, you know, across Australia are very excited and will attend a lot of games. Um, I think ticket prices are starting at, like, $20, right? So it's pretty cheap to even attend, which, you know, if it was men's, it would be hundreds of dollars. So... There is that parity, but um, disparity, sorry, but you know we want to get people to games to start with, and then it can grow from there. Highest number of countries represented, you know, biggest everything, and yeah, you're right. I think we've really got to advocate for greater um, publicity within the next 23 days. Yeah. So, Philippa, will you be going along? Do you love watching cross the cross sports? Um, yeah, I do love soccer. Um, uh, do watch a bit of rugby. Um, obviously, grew up with Union, 
Um, but I, I'm really excited for the World Cup to come. And I didn't, until you said that, obviously, because I, into soccer, I'm um, aware of it. But now that you said that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't, I like can't even think of seeing any advertisement. Um, but I, I'm very excited. O obviously, support the Matildas and then the Banyanas, the South African team. So uh, um, we'll probably, hopefully, I, I think I'm home. Um, I go away for a month. So I think when I get back, um, try to figure out when, which games I'll be able to get some tickets. But um, yeah, also athletics. Um, my dad watches a lot of that, um, and yeah, I, I, there was a while there where I'd played soccer for Merriweather, um, just under 18s and then all age women, and then I was like, oh, maybe after surfing I'll play for the Matildas, but um, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, my skills are not good, but I can dream, so good. <laughs> I, th I think if all girls dream, we'd be in a better place. What about yourself, Susie? I did ask backstage who watched the women's cricket last night and I got a yeah. no response from you. Disappointing. I didn't hear that question. <laughs> <laughs> it was, for those who didn't watch it, Australia won uh, over England. So I was stoked in the lounge room. Um, Susie, what about yourself in terms of across other sports, like watching, playing? You did mention to us that you played rugby league now as well. Yeah, sadly. Sorry, Dad. I crossed over and play a bit of league at the moment, um, just because I don't know, play more sport. Um, but yeah, no, love watching other sports just because I enjoy sport, but also because lifting other women's sports helps everyone together. So as you said, like tickets are mostly pretty cheap, sadly, for a lot of women's sports. So it's not um, going to break the bank to try and support them, but also just like turning the TV on and watching whatever's on telly, like the women's origin was played on the Thursday night after the men's, but I don't know how many people knew that that was a thing. Um, I know I was texting all my family group chats and friends group chats saying, I don't even care if you don't like league, just put it on the background, like it yeah. helps boost numbers, which helps, um, I guess, work towards getting them um, on a bit of a better stage. And like the women's origin last Thursday, it was such a good game and, and um, they only have, the women's only have I'm probably preaching to the crowd here, but the women's, they only have two games. Queensland won the first one, New South Wales won the second one, and then now they just kind of have to call the yeah. Queensland celebrating on points difference, um, whereas now the men get to play off for a third game, even though Queensland have won regardless. So yeah, Crazy. Yeah, bit of a bummer. But, yeah, for everyone at home, just support any code you like in whatever way you can. It all helps. Mm. I did hear my husband say last Thursday night, I actually thought that was a better game than the men's, so... After yeah. all those years living with me, I, I think I'm rubbing off on him finally. <laughs> hey. um, you've all mentioned about the importance of seeing other, you know, other sports, and at least your, certainly your research alluded to that. What do you think will come out of young girls and, and their families indeed, and their husbands and partners, watching the World Cup, the Football World Cup, Tara? What would you like to see come out of it, more to the point? Well, I guess the phrase is that you can't be what you can't see, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for me as a little girl growing up, if I, you know, didn't see the Matildas, I think I met Cheryl Salisbury when I was, you know, playing for Merriweather and I was like, oh, my God, she's amazing. So, like, if I didn't see her when I was that young, like, who knows if I could be where I am now. So I think, yeah, being able to see what you, you know, want to be in the future that will just go so far in the development of girls and, and girls in sport. Yep. And will that assist your research, Elise, if you can you know, see a real positive flow on from the World Cup? For sure. I think that um, the girls having the opportunity and just overall um, families watching female sport on this platform is just so imperative for potential sign-ups and also like I'd like to be like them I can resonate with them and look how huge it is and how much of a success because I know if you do watch it it's going to be a real thrill to see the elite athletes out there and what kind of game they bring um, but there is a stat and I don't know the exact number but um, when the Olympics are televised there is the greatest spike in girls signing up to sports because guess what, that's when you actually have 50-50 coverage of men and women's sports. 
So imagine if that was the case for all sports and we didn't have to think, oh, you've got to log on to a different subscription to be able to watch that game because at the moment there's the Asia um, women's basketball um, games are being televised, but it's not free to air. Um, I mean, you've got the cricket. We had the T20 World Cup, but that was like, you know, a sold out, you know, record crowd at the MCG. So, yeah, it would be great if it was just even, but we're, we're working towards that. I remember last year, Susie, when we had the um, Australian University Sevens here in Newcastle and I was invited to do the commentary. It was so good, but you're right. We had to find the search engine to, f you know, how to get onto it. But you had look, Charlotte, Charlotte Kaslick, you know, th these gold medal winners from the games in the Uni Seven. Can you remember that tournament? Did you play in that? It was last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that we, uh, at Charlestown? No, no, no. No, we played on the Hello Number Two Sports Ground. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I remember being a bit too nervous running out against all the Aussie Sevens players. Yeah, that's right. So it was a great concept. So it was the Australian Rugby Sevens, and what they did was um, a number of Australian players filtered into the teams. And I think Newcastle drew a couple of guns. Yeah, Newcastle does well in those tournaments. We don't do very well in the lead-up ones, and then suddenly we just sort of win on the last one. Last this year we no last year sorry we won the last game against Bond Uni who never lose. And then Bond in their speech just said, "Wow, I guess like Newcastle winning it just shows like yeah, anything's possible, right?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, good. she hasn't visited Newcastle yeah. too much. <laughs> Philippa, what about you? Were the first ever winner of Surfest, first ever local winner in, in Surfest. Male or female? Male or female? How cool was it being cheered up the beach and all those young Merriweather grommets flocking around you? Oh, yeah, that was that was a, a while ago. Um, still, probably one of the best wins in my life for sure. Um, and I just, I, I think with with surfing, it's um, obviously televised men and women, and they kind of get or they get the same with um, with our league. So. That's, that's really cool, we don't have that problem, but what I think you, when you guys touched on seeing actually the World Cup, obviously I grew up um, and I went to a few events, uh, the J Bay Pro when I was younger, and a few surf fests that did come to town um, when, when we had moved, and just seeing the likes of the, the men and women and physically seeing that, and then I was being chaired up the beach, and I wasn't one of the kids like yeah. cheering, being around the, one of the winners. Um, so that was yeah, really special. Um, I have a few photos um, in yeah on, on the laptop and um, on file of all all the, the little Meriwether grums, and now they obviously like a, a lot older, and they're still surfing. Um, and some of them are doing really well, so it just kind of shows the impact of being having access to that. Um, and surfing's a little bit different, obviously it's quite, it's free, you can go to the beach and watch it. Um, but I still get starstruck when I go to an event and I see Steph, or when Sally and them used to come to Surfest and I was teammates with them and I'm still like, as you say, when you met, um, uh, she, yeah, you were like, oh my gosh, she's awesome. I still have that with some of the girls I compete against and that's just because when you have that experience with professional athletes and I'm still an athlete and I'm professional so I can't imagine the impact on a young girl that has a dream and I'm still like, whoa. So I'm all about, you know, if, if there's an opportunity to be close and even see obviously on the TV but now we have the, the World Cup coming to Newcastle those little girls are going to go to the field and they're going to actually maybe touch them when they walk past. Like, that goes such a long way. And because I've had that experience, it, um, yeah, it's really cool. And Surfest, the, the structure has changed, so it's still a, a regional qualifier, whereas um, back when I won it, it was on the global um, qualifying series. So it, it definitely still is ranked quite high and you have the top Australians come. You might have a few international um, surfers come but it's still um, a, quite a big event. And Jackson won last year. He was 
the second or third local, I think one or two of the boys. Yeah, I think Ryan and Julian Wilson tied the year before. Yeah. I mean, I love Julian, but he is kind of a blow and he's from the sunny yeah, coast. But, <laughs> but we do own we'll, Ryan. We'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's a really special moment. Um, and I still, yeah, it's pretty pretty weird. This bumps. <laughs> yeah. <stuff. laughs> Tara, what does a typical week look like for you both as an athlete and a civil engineer? Yeah, well, I won't tell you right now. Maybe, um, yeah, a few months back when I was still with the Jets. Um, so we had four sort of field sessions a week in the afternoon. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and then gym sort of Tuesday morning and Thursday mornings. And then travel or get ready for the games, obviously, on the weekend, either a Saturday session and then play Sunday or, or travel away. So... All that plus, I guess, full-time work, um, which was pretty hectic, to be honest. And there was times, there have been many times over the years where, you know, these girls might have had the same, you get to the point and you just get to the end of the week and you're like, I just don't know if I can do it. Like, I'm exhausted and, like, I've cried at times where I'm just so tired and, you know, you have to get up the next day and you have to go back again and you just keep going. But, you know, it's... It's sad that it's at that point where we, we can't just have one full-time job. You know, we have to have sort of two full-time jobs. We can't, we can't be like the men and earn enough money to do that because I would love to see where all female sports women can go with doing full-time sport, you know, as their one job where they can rest, recover, perform, get everything they need to be able to be at their peak performance um, and I just, yeah, I think sports would just go crazy and, and females would just be great sports people. Mm. Susie, you mentioned about the five hour travel to go to Canberra and you did not get a cup of coffee. Um, what about you now, you know, being the medical student as well as the cross code footy players? Yeah, that Canberra travelling worked a bit better when I was sort of that first couple of years at uni and it's kind of mainly lectures and a lot of that you can kind of do on the road, uh, which is sort of how I did it. Um, but now we're sort of placement five days a week. Um, so I've, and I've picked up rugby league, so it's training sort of four times a week, trying gym four times a week because I've done a couple of ACLs and I need to prevent doing a third one. Um, and then play Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday's a lovely recovery day and, and go again. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a balance. Like some weeks uni sort of takes more of a priority. I wouldn't say I cut out any uh, rugby, but I sort of, kind of work out where can I give 100% and where am I going to just turn up and just kind of give the bare minimum and I guess that's how I try and manage it. And, but as Tara said, like sometimes you just have weeks and you just, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do it next week. And other times you're like, let's go, let's do more. So it's, yeah. Does the adrenaline keep you going? It does, yeah. Yeah. Although I come off the back of a loss on Saturday and a, and a hammy injury, the adrenaline drops a little bit, but I know it'll pick back up eventually. Yeah. And what about you, Philippa? You've got your coaching school. You know, if it's 14 degrees surf, people are still flocking oh. to get on that board. How yeah. do you cope? <laughs> Kids don't feel the cold at the moment. <laughs> um, if you asked me this question before COVID, um, still pretty tough just with our travel. Um, a lot of our events are international, but now that I own a business, it's just skyrocketed stress, anxiety. <laughs> And we're fitting in gymming three times a week and then trying to surf and then make sure I rock up to my job at 100%, which is what I love. Um, but, yeah, very different um, to competing and travelling before COVID. Um, and, yeah, surfing is my passion and I'm, uh, it was a big step. Um, I finished year 12 and didn't go to uni and wanted to give it a solid crack. Um, I thought maybe opening a surf school later on in my career would, would be ideal. Um, but then our comp stopped for a year and a half and my dad was like, you can't live under here and not pay rent, so you need to go get a job. He said those exact words. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, yeah, I started the surf school and it's been really, really good but really tough um, at my level to try to juggle juggle that. Um, my dad definitely helps a lot with the surf school, but I pretty much, yeah, run everything. Um, Mom and dad are really good with the support, and you definitely need that, and even in a team's environment, you definitely need that um, support to help with friends and family. Um, but yeah, um, I had one of those weeks last week where I just, I just cried. I was like, oh, this is just <laughs> one of those weeks, but um, yeah, you just, you kind of, I guess a, a um, 
yeah, being a professional surfer, you just wake up the next day and you go, okay, today's a new day. What can I do that's in front of me to just maybe get out of that ruck? Um, but then, yeah, you do look forward to the next trip and you try um, better your last result. And, yeah, I, I think because both my jobs are really physical um, and they're both in the water, so I just constantly have wet hair. It was pretty funny that I yeah, didn't have wet hair, I didn't work this afternoon, so that was a plus. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I do. I do know there's a lot of other professional surfers in in my um, what we're doing on the Challenger series that are in the same boat. Um, I'd say probably only the top five or eight percent of uh, women professional surfers are earning enough money to actually have a future after their career. Um, it's it's pretty. Um, yeah, it's pretty sad to see a lot of the top girls on tour and top 17 that um, might not have major backing. Um, and what I do is like a level underneath, so there's even, uh, I guess, less backing. But for me personally, I, I've had a lot of support and I'm really thankful for that. And that's what I want to do with my school. I want to, yeah, be able to, in you know, a few years' time, give free surf lessons to kids and, and girls. And after looking at your screen and seeing how just that involvement and how a little bit of encouragement and like girls can surf too. So yeah, that was really cool to see your slide and um, surfing has given me so much. So that's a really big part of, of what I want to yeah do with the school. Great. Yeah. And Elise, in terms of juggling, you know, three daughters, a house, more research, how do you, what's a typical week look like for you? Well, I have to go to the gym at 5.10 in the morning, and I like that, though, because it's my time. That's the only time to get it done. Um, I work part-time, so, you know, just three days when I'm at work, I really enjoy that. But then, obviously, I really want to give my daughters the best opportunity to be involved in sports. So I coach their the under-seven dynamos, um, which I love, and I love empowering that group of girls and, um, you know, giving them the confidence to enjoy playing Soccer or football is the correct term, but I always say soccer. Um, you know, um, yeah, like I just think that I've got a passion and I want to make sure that I can be a positive role model too uh, in myself for my family and my peers, but also, um, you know, still, yeah, I think improve. I'm just listening to all these little traits that you've all got and something that's really common, which um, is everyone's resilience their bravery and also um, just being able to apply yourself um, when times are tough. So I think that's come through through all of your um, sporting careers and where you are at the moment. So hopefully just bringing it back to say daughters and dads and the things that we um, empower young girls to have these skills, these social emotional skills, um, they can grow up and be whatever they want to be and achieve what they want to achieve. And just before we hand over to the audience for a couple of questions. One wish for women's sport um, as we progress down the track, for either you personally or for women's sport in general? One wish. Oh, I think it's equity, isn't it, for me? Yeah. yeah. I'd have to say that, you know, the slide I referred to where we have to give the double box, which is the equity, we don't need that. Just It's going to be equal for all and there's not a disparity. Um, that would be my wish. And that, you know what? One day that we don't actually need a program like Daughters and Dads. It's just, it's there. Mm. Okay. Um, I, yeah, if, when the girls filled out the question saying, what did you see at school today? Just young boys, um, oh, girls can't play, girls can't surf. And it's, yeah, one whoosh into surf that like, if there's a girl out the back that's also deep and the good guy sees the girl and, and goes, okay, that's her wave and doesn't go, oh, well, she's a girl, so I'm gonna go, cause she's not gonna go. That happens a lot. So my whoosh would just be, maybe in our surfing environment for the males or the young boys to maybe be aware of that and go, oh, yep, they're out here. They're the same as me. They deserve that. that that's a big thing that I see and would wish for. Susie? Yeah, probably similar to that, just that recognition and it, it means a lot coming from, I guess, male figures in particular. Um, so 
sorry to bring it back to rugby, but that origin game. So those women haven't had a season. They've kind of come off the back of an off season, which is typically when you play your worst footy, but they've played an incredible game compared to the men who have kind of been mid-season. So just recognising the their talent and their resilience for what they have. And even though they haven't been given the same opportunities, they've still pushed and they've still pulled out um, a really incredible game. So, yeah, just recognition. Excellent. So, I mean, we could sit here and talk all night, but I think, I think we're on a time limit. So, we do have a couple of minutes. If someone has a burning question, if you'd like to... Um, Put your hand up. We got someone. Yes. We've got this box for you. It's not a lucky door prize. All you have to do is speak into it. <coughs> is this a joke? No. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It is a joke. Oh, thank you. We've got two boxes. Um, thank you so much um, to the panel for sharing their experiences of inequality in their um, respective sports. And sadly, none of that is actually surprising to us who, who follow women's sport. But what I wanted to ask, um, you know, we're talking about empowerment for girls and women and the role that dads and men can play in that. Have any of you um, women found that in your respective sports that your male counterparts have ever spoken up? Because they must see that inequality, like Tara talked about the Jets, men, how they get so many other things more than the women do. Um, they must see that as well. Do they ever advocate? Do they ever speak up? Or is it a bit like pie, where they think that if they mention it, they'll lose their slice? Um, I, th I think it's a bit of a mix, to be honest. I think there's some males out there that advocates and would speak up and you know say something but there's also a lot that well maybe not a lot but there's still some that just sit silently and, and won't say anything and as you say like well if I say something maybe they'll take something away from me and I'll have to give up some of my salary you know to pay the women so I think it's a bit of a mix I don't know what it would be but there's definitely probably not enough males that, that speak up um, for, for equity. Um, within the surfing uh, community and definitely on the professional league that I do, um, there was a change about five years ago when the men actually, the level of the women's just stood up. You had Carissa Moore and Tyler Wright and Lakey Peterson who just put on amazing performances in three events and then the actual men around on the CT and all the professional male surfers were like, oh, Okay, I, th I think they can surf. And then there was a lot of respect, but it was just this one year where the girls were given an opportunity to have um, an event in uh, a really high risk um, surf break because before that it was just like, oh, the woman, they won't be able to do that. But like, we were never given an opportunity. Give us the opportunity and everyone was like, oh, okay. So that has improved a lot. Um, and I actually think it's pretty good at, at our high level. Everyone supports each other um, and everyone does know within we're all on the, the, the this top 17 girls, like they do surf well enough to get there. But probably 10 years ago, if you had asked that question, would it be like, mm, the guys think that the girls suck? And that was very open. And even, um, even around maybe locally as well, you kind of just felt that. So there's been a lot of professional surfers before me that have really paved the path. Um, and now guys that are like, actually, yeah, that was cool. Or like, she does surf well and they're not scared to support that, um, which, yeah, is, is really cool. We might just take another question if you'd like to direct it to. Yeah, Richie Williams. Um, uh, firstly, Elise, a fantastic presentation. Alina, well chaired. It's a, it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, and particularly for one that's a grandfather. I've got three boys, but all of them have got girls. So um, it was wonderful to see this. Uh, the big catch cry from your presentation was if you can't see it, you can't be it. And uh, you talked about the media at 10%. Helene, you came up with your research at 20%. Uh, my question is more so about the media and whether the glass ceiling's an impact there. And sports women journalists 
where do we stand with that in a relationship of that 10, 20%? Is that an area that we need to study women? Have women actually becoming more affluent and present in the sports media? And I'd like to ask the ladies as well, as professional athletes, um, the interview processes that you had, was it male, female? Were the questions kind of relevant to get the exposure that you need to give out to the general public and to young girls growing up? It's a great question. Thanks, Richie. Also, Richie, you can do the program with your granddaughters if you want when I they are. I don't want to show my sons up. <laughs> um, I definitely think that we're starting to see more females in um, that area. I know um, particularly, say, with um, the NRL, there are women there that are commentating and, and being seen and present, and that is really positive because if we have women that are working across a variety of roles, whether it's in volunteering and coaching or commentating, um, that's another avenue to be involved in the sport. Um, but certainly, I think that knowing that their opportunities are there and, and given to women is, is imperative. And so we need people that are at that higher level. Um, and, and whether there's boards, you know, predominantly of men, we need to get that equal um, balance of women there who, has a, who have a say um, in, in bigger roles of, of CEOs of sporting agencies and whatnot. But um, what have you found, um, girls? Well, we might just see Susie because rugby and rugby league are, you know, relatively new, I guess, in terms of the women's domain. Yeah, I think Newcastle Herald is certainly better than a lot of other areas. I'll just use that as a, an example because they write a bit about the wildfires. Um, certainly better in terms of publishing, like they'll always put, a, I guess, an update for the women's side of thing. It, it might sometimes be kind of just down the bottom corner, but it's, it's on there. Um, and in terms of the interview process, I feel like um, coaches for a lot of the women's teams sometimes get the interviews. Um, I've just what I've seen across sort of multiple codes. Um, so it would be good if um, a lot more of the women kind of get involved. Very few of them like have had any kind of media training or have done a lot of that. So I guess it would be a bit of a, a work in progress in time in terms of um, getting them up to getting them some experience, I guess. But I think that would be probably mutually beneficial. So yeah, a good area to work on. Maybe I might start a business up. <laughs> Please. I think we have one more question. Yes, thank you. Hi, Gabby Sainsbury here. Uh, we heard from our CEO, Deborah Wright, earlier this evening. Um, I'm on the board of Newcastle University Sport. Um, a long passion for sport as well. I, I played at a national level in two sports. But my expertise is in uh, corporate governance and sports governance as a passion. So my question is, the decisions that are being made that you've touched on tonight that are impacting women in a negative way or, you know, providing those barriers, how do, what structures have you seen that are effective in getting those decisions to consider the issues that we're, we're tackling tonight? What have you seen work well or what would you charge your, you know, um, organisation, the committees, the state, the national bodies to put in place to make better decisions on these issues? And Helen, perhaps you can even chime in. I'm sure you've got some thoughts on that with your experience. <laughs> Put you in the hot seat. I don't worry about a glass ceiling. I just figure if I'm good enough, then I, I go for it. You know, I've been the chair of Northern New South Wales football and it's, um, I just rock up to the meeting. Sadly, we were overthrown and sacked at the end of last year in a, a takeover by a group of um, men with, or people with gender glasses on. Um, you know, but really, I, I just think um, the the rules are there, and if you, but it's always with putting women on boards. It's a quota, you know. Or we we have to have 40, 40, 20. I mean, what's that about? If if I was going to have a board now, I'd have a hundred nil. You know, it's just it, the rules aren't geared to the world we live in. The rules are geared to how they used to be. I think we really need to bring sport into the 2024. Yeah. What about um, what about the governance of uh, yeah, let's go football? I'll go. I'll go. Um, I, I guess my view. So I've obviously played with the Jets for a long time, so 13 years um, there. So I've seen football 
come a long way, probably not come as far as it should have um, in that time. So now, more recently, AFLW, NRLW have come in. So the path that football has taken over that time started pretty well and then we sort of started to plateau. So, um, you know, in the last couple of years, AFLW has come in, minimum wage has, you know, shot up to whatever it is, NRLW has come in. Um, the trajectory of those two sports compared to football is, I believe, a lot higher. So you've got to put money in to obviously get your investment back, right? I know people don't want to put money in because they're waiting for more people to view the sport, more sponsors, but you have to make an aggressive attack to start with to get people to actually invest in it, get the facilities. I've heard um, the NRLW Knights have this massive gym, you know, where they can use the same gym as the men's. Um, we use a gym that's sort of in Gateshead that someone's owns that we can use. So they've gone straight for the attack and they said, you know, you can use these facilities and we want to be, you know, this good in, you know, next year, the year after. So you have to make an aggressive attack straight away and you have to put money in. I think that's probably the best approach from my perspective. And um, Philippa, you... Yeah. you mentioned earlier Jessie Miley Dyer. She is a dynamite uh, lawyer. By, yep. by business, and, and she certainly has taken over the Australian yeah. surfing. And she, she was also on the World Championship Tour, so she experienced that, and she felt that, and I'll encourage any, everyone in this room to go watch the movie Girls Can't Surf. It really gives you a, f a full insight into what those females were. They weren't competing against each other, they were competing against the males and the governing body. So that's what I mean, WSL has improved so much since then. You'll be shocked at that that was even called professional surfing for women. Um, but fast forward to now, surfing New South Wales and Australia has, um, I feel like, a, a lot better than maybe some of the team sports within the bodies. They are all for women and really starting to support that. Um, I, I, we just got an email the other day. If you want to become a surf instructor, female, they're not going to make you pay for your uh, foundation course. Um, so that's encouraging then more females to go, hey, maybe, yeah, I'll be a surf coach. And then it's running through the board riders. They're giving a lot of grants to um, the board riders f through female. Um, and that is also linking to, but you need to have a female coach if you want this grant to be used for the board riders. Um, but that is filtering into competitions. Um, so I, I do think we have come a long way and we're in the right direction. And it is really cool to see now Jesse Maladaya and our commentary team as well. It's, it's mixed. Um, and the, there's a lot of other events like the ISA um, World Games. They have male and female. So... I do feel like we, we are, I'm quite lucky in our sport, um, but I think still with female sports in general, there is such a long way to go. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of other things that I can see from a professional um, surfer and a, a business owner that there's, there's so much opportunity. And I think it's just making people aware of that. That's yeah. what I found the biggest thing. And Susie, we had Raylene Castles, the CEO of Rugby Australia. We got rid of her. We put the leather patches back in. So how do you feel about the governance of rugby? Yeah, it's, it's tough. I, I feel like I started playing rugby league as well as rugby union because rugby league just have a plan. They, they're happy to say, look, we're, our women's game isn't where it can be, but like we've got a plan for it. So minimum wage was ten thousand last year. It's thirty thousand this year, and it's going up next year. Like, it's it's good for it. Not, uh, they could say it's not perfect now, but at least we have a plan for it to get better. Um, and that in itself is a lot of recognition for what the athletes are putting in. Which Rugby Australia sadly doesn't have much of a plan to to lift. I think now they're paying them four thousand dollars a season. It's, it's kind of like a five, six game season, so it's still not a, a plan so you can show up every week and every season and put all the work in and kind of turn down job opportunities or whatever else you're sacrificing for it. But if it's not getting you and getting the sport to a better place, it's sort of hard to continue to make those sacrifices. So just to your point, it's probably just a, have a plan and work with the women to have a plan to take it to a point where everyone's happy um, and that way, uh, yeah, I guess that way you, everyone's improving. I think my wish would be not to call it women's sport, but to call it sport. 
I think that would be the biggest step forward we could take. Well, that's, uh, that's about our night up. So I think we're going to invite the Vice-Chancellor to come onto the stage and do a vote of thanks, if you're if you game enough to come into this female domain. Show us a bit of resilience, a bit of persistence. <coughs> what were those other words? Bravery. 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 A bit of bravery. A bit of bravery. Well, wonderful. Good evening, everybody, and uh, what a great panel we've had tonight, and what a great session. So I think, uh, thank you, Helen, uh, for being our MC. Yes, I think that last remark, it's, we should be talking about sport. That's exactly right. Yeah, I think you summarised that well. But um, certainly for our university, we really are uh, supporting the role of sport. And I think, you know, tonight you talked very much about, you know, the roles of professionals and you want to have those opportunities. But I really think you've really benefited from getting a university education or starting a small business. Too many, too often I see the male professional athletes have nothing to go to after they've finished their sport. And I think the way you guys are doing it, being you know, dual skilled, being a small business owner like Philippa, or a doctor, you know, or a civil engineer, or an academic, you, know, you can actually do a lot. Uh, and I think having those dual qualifications or that, that, that gives you that resilience because a lot of sports, there isn't a kind of a, when you look at the elite, they do well, but then there's all the other participants and you've got to have them to fall back on something. And I think education is so important. Anyway, there's my plug for the university. But back to the, <laughs> back to what we heard about tonight. You know, I love the Dads and Daughters uh, program. Oh, sorry, Daughters and Dads uh, program. It's a, it's a wonderful program. I was introduced to it very early uh, in my tenure at the university. I was, the gentleman who spoke earlier, I think, yeah, granddads and daughters is good. I certainly had a daughter and I wish I had this program when she was growing up and so hopefully I can get the chance to do this with a granddaughter so I, I will be there but um, the other part here is that um, the university wants to see these uh, you know equity and equality that's one of our um, values of the university and I think you really um, uh, Elise described it well, the difference between the two, that little graphic figure. I even took a little photo of that <laughs> with my camera at the, sitting at the front. I think it's a great way to d describe the difference. But uh, obviously we do want you know, equity in, 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 in the outcomes ultimately and you do need to get a boost. And ultimately there's a quality what we want, so you can't tell the difference and it's just about sport as you ladies were talking about today. But uh, we, we certainly want to see that and, uh, and I really do want to see you know, e e equal participation and certainly one of the things that we have, uh, the university does support all the teams in, in, the, in the Hunter and we do support male and female sports. And, uh, but it was really interesting when I spoke to Phil Gardner, who's the CEO of West Sue, back in the Knights and he said for their club, females have been at the team have been transformational. It's actually made the club a better club. Uh, it's actually socially better, people behave better, there's just, there's so much, you know, well, it's just not one gender, actually bring two people together from, uh, and ma makes it very, like, I guess reflect what society should be about and, uh, and, and I think it's great to see that the female knights are the reigning premiers and uh, doing well so it's, uh, it's and uh, they're leading the way and uh, it's, it's just wonderful and uh, to see that. Um, for the university, I think one of the things we will be, and we'll probably take it, or you'll hear about this later in the year, but we'll be establishing an academy of sports, exercise and nutrition, which will bring the professional sports into the university and tie it back to our programs in physical education, exercise science and nutrition. We think we can have a fantastic uh, program here. We've got a really world-class facilities uh, in new sport led by Deb Wright and her team. We think that is the foundation from which we can put our academic programs into it. I think we've had to find a way to have a sporting school, a, sport, uh, say a sporting school with a surfing program in there, And uh, but I think that would be great. And I was just thinking our international students should all learn to surf when they come to... Uh, yeah, and I, I think we should be doing more of that. So that's great, Philip. So, and uh, I'd love to see that. But I think the program should be very our elite programs. We, we've got fantastic facilities, great programs, great leaders here. Great, uh, and uh, how can we bring them together and really make uh, the Hunter and uh, a real place 
for sports excellence and in, in every every way for the community. And uh, I've got to say it, yes, FIFA World Cup, it's true. It's not being programmed as much as it should be. And I'll certainly get onto social media and do a bit of a plug for that myself. It's an important element. We see ourselves going forward. And, and there's a, a Rugby World Cup coming. So I, I think that's something we'll, we'll see if we can get to host some of the teams or things here. We've got the Sports Academy. I think it'll help us get into that situation where we can track male, female teams, because there will be two World Cups uh, in the rugby, and we've got to make sure that there is something there. And certainly I'll be ad an advocate for a daughter's and uh, dad's rugby program, given what you said about uh, what was happening there. Not good enough, absolutely not good enough. So, but look, ladies and gentlemen, I won't keep you any longer. I think we'd love to socialise outside for some drinks and uh, a bit of bite, of bite to eat, but... Um, Thank you very much for coming to the University of Newcastle and to hear at our Looking Ahead uh, lectures because looking ahead is something that the university is about, looking ahead to the future for a better future. And it's lovely to have these uh, female pioneers here in sports doing, showing the way how it should be. And that's what the university is about. So good evening and thank you very much. Thank you.